This is the Wisdom Podcast. Welcome to the Wisdom Podcast. My name is Daniel Aitken, and today we're joined by Stephen Armstrong, Senior Vipassana Teacher. Stephen has trained extensively in the tradition of Mahasi Sayadaw and is the managing editor of the new book, Manual of Insight, by Mahasi Sayadaw. In today's episode, we hear how Steve went from following the Grateful Dead to living in a Burmese Buddhist monastery, how he eventually came back to the West and Western life and started teaching insight meditation. So I hope you enjoy this conversation with Stephen. people start their journey and so I just was interested in what might have started your journey how you came to this meditative practice wow that's really an interesting question because (laughs) after university I was aimlessly drifting about in this is in the late um, 60s early 70s and I was uh, living in a commune up in central Maine at the time Okay. And the focus yep. of the commune was uh, we were all Grateful Dead heads and uh, Pink Floydians. So oh, really? that was our that was our spiritual practice: uh, going to Dead shows, listening to Grateful Dead music, and Pink Floyd shows. And wow! We, and you considered that spiritual we, practice then? Yeah, that was our practice. And of course, we were partaking wow. of the sacrament as often as necessary. Yes. And but that was our mm-hmm. idea of a spiritual life. Mm-hmm. And um, I'd been living there for a while, and one woman uh, at the uh, commune uh, picked up this book, uh, Beginning to See, by Sujata. It's one of the first books out about mindfulness, little one-liners about Mm -hmm. mindfulness. And she was reading it, and I looked through it, and it was all interesting, but didn't resonate with anything with me. I wasn't wasn't interested in meditation. I didn't know anyone who meditated. I wasn't a Buddhist. I didn't know anything about Buddhism or spirituality, really. Uh, I was into drugs and living in a commune. But in the back of the book was this um, address, you know, if you'd like more information, please write here. So she wrote and found out from the person who answered that, oh, there's a retreat in this method going on right now in Bucksport, Maine. And we were living in central Maine, about an hour and a half away. Mm -hmm. And the last two weeks of this first three-month course in 1975 was open to new beginners. So Mm -hmm. we went to this retreat. We decided to go and didn't know what to expect. And, you know, as I tell the story, we drove there and there had been 50 or 60 people that had been practicing now for two and a half months, the first month, three-month retreat Mm -hmm. with Jack Joseph Sharon and another teacher. And we yes. um, walked into the lobby, and on one side was the dining room saying, new arrivals will meet at 5 o'clock or something. And on the right-hand side mm-hmm. was the door to the chapel. It was an old Catholic monastery. And we yeah. looked at the schedule on the door, and it said, you know, 4 o'clock, wake up, and do your yoga, and sit, walk, breakfast, sit, walk, sit, walk, sit, walk, lunch, sit, walk, sit, walk, sit, walk, tea. Uh, and then at uh, 7.30, it said, talk and then further practice after 9 o'clock. And so we looked at each other and said, well, at least we get an hour a day to talk to each other. But really what <laughs> that meant was we had an hour a day to listen to somebody. <laughs> so, yes, well, yes, talk. <laughs> we didn't talk. No, we didn't talk. It was a silent retreat. <laughs> Nobody was looking at us. They were all wrapped up in blankets, walking around, shuffling around like uh, they were in a, uh, deeply within. So we got there and we did the retreat. And it was excruciating. Wow. I mean, it was it was so yep. painful physically, you know. I wasn't used to sitting. I didn't ever do yep. that. And then mentally, my mind was a mess, you know, like I think most yeah. of us discover when we take a look. But yep. one thing that uh, really struck with me is when I heard the evening Dharma talks, and they were the basic Dharma talks mm-hmm. of Four Noble Truths, Eightfold Path, you know, loving kindness, um, the usual mindfulness, you know, five faculties, whatever it is. It's like 
I heard something for the first time that I'd always known, felt, and believed inside myself. Mm -hmm. it, was just, yeah. it was just so resonant with how I understood the world and life to be, even though I'd never heard it, never read it, didn't know anybody that believed it. Yeah. And so it was not so a matter you, of doubt you, or faith or questioning. It was just like, oh, this is it. I get it. Yeah. And that was my introduction. Wow. And so how were you how did you like contrast the life like that's a really huge contrast bet between what you had been doing yeah and what this was happening on this retreat how did you how did you like you know after the retreat what were you thinking like as the retreat's ending and you're and you're like going back to that life how did you compare the two well ways of living that's an interesting question too because when you're when when you go to a retreat like that, or when I went to the retreat, and I see it in students too, you come to the retreat with mm -hmm. your normal, ordinary, chattering mind, and the, mm -hmm. the retreat format and process is so gradual and so moment by moment that you don't notice that you're getting deeper within the mind and further away from the mental chatter. Or you might be getting closer to the mental yes. chatter, but you're... You're, you're, you're coming to a different understanding. You're having a different relationship with all that's going on in the mind. But it's such a gradual mm -hmm. immersion into the interior of the heart, into the interior of the mind, that, yeah, there's days when it's a struggle and you're, you, know, you have some emotions and you're frustrated and you know, whatever. But you're still there yeah. and all you're getting is the input of dharma, dharma understanding, dharma practice, encouragement, inspiration. And so you just keep doing it. So at the mm -hmm. end of two weeks, you're in, your mind is in a very, very different place, but you don't know it because you've just been with yeah. it every step of the way. And so it isn't until yep. you leave and you go out and you go into the grocery store, you go into a restaurant or you get in the car and driving or something that then you notice like, yes. wow, things are a little different here. Yeah, maybe I shouldn't be driving home. <laughs> <laughs> so, luckily for us, the, the, the commune was only about an hour and a half away. We drove, <laughs> we drove back. We got to the commune. Everything was the same. You know, same people doing the same thing, same building, same yeah. activities, same what not. But it all yeah. looked very, it all, we understood it to be very, very, diff very differently. We just, we were just Yeah, because you, you had a reference point for where you were now. Yeah. Because, okay. yeah, it's good to have that reference point and look back. Yeah, it's like so stepping then what was out and taking a look and then really seeing, well, what is going on here? And, yeah, you know, the awakening of faith that happened, faith and confidence that happened on that retreat was phenomenal. Yeah. Um, just what do you mean by faith? Faith, it was, it was like faith, in my understanding, was not so much... I believe and therefore I'm saved type of thing. It's faith in yep. this is the path. This is the practice. This is what mm. will bring me to whatever it is I am to discover about. I didn't yes. really, I don't yep. use the language, spiritual life, spiritual path or anything like that. I just used, oh, this is, yep. the, this is the practice that's going to show me myself. Uh-huh, yep. And, and uh, so... so you know, in, in, in our tradition and what I teach is that, well, faith seeks the good. And I felt, yep. you know, my life was so dissipated and so dissolute and so dispersed up to that time mm. that having two weeks of kind of collectedness and unification of mind, it's like, wow, I just dropped into a place and said, this is where I, this is where I want to be. This is, this is how I want to understand myself and others. And... Yeah. just saw the value of that kind of samadhi or stillness or collectedness and had faith that this was a vehicle for my life. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I mean by faith. Um, yes, and therefore nice. I felt empowered, I felt encouraged, I felt inspired to continue practice. And that began a whole yeah. series of retreats over the next several years. Um, that I so then how, how did you how did you know where to go next so you've arrived back at the commune yeah. and and you sort of have some confidence in this this method yeah. and how do you pursue that well that's you know it's it's kind of hard now to believe that that was the first three month retreat there were no other retreats mm -hmm. going on 
IMS was purchased after that retreat. It was so that was the first three-month retreat in, in the States? Yes, it was. That was the first uh, three-month retreat. Jack and Joseph and Sharon had been teaching wow. for a year, starting in 74, yep. I think. And this was the first three-month yep. retreat in 75. They bought IMS in 76. Uh-huh. And, and they were giving the talks at this retreat, is that right? They were what? When you t- when you talk, they were they were the ones giving the talks yep, at this yep. tre- Jack retreat. Jack Sharon, yep. and there was another fellow, Richard yep. Barsky, who has since passed away. Yeah, uh-huh. They were leading yep. the retreat. So there really wasn't IMS wasn't formed. There wasn't any place. It wasn't really up and running until later that year, and in seventy seven, mm. and that's when I mean in seventy six. So uh, at some point, I got a a flyer, an announcement from the organizers saying, hey, we've bought this place, an old Catholic uh, seminary or training school or something, and it's Mm -hmm. in rough shape, and we need builders and carpenters and painters and whatever to come fix it up so we can have a retreat center. And as soon as I got that, I said, I'm going, because I, I was a builder. Uh, doing carpentry work mm. and had been painting and did electrical and plumbing and I just I just knew all those trades, so I just volunteered for three weeks. You know, it was a three week retreat, so I volunteered and went, and I had an interesting, exper- really interesting experience. I'm not a woo woo wow wow type of guy. I'm not, yeah. I'm not easily kind of like woo woo wow wow <laughs> at all. Yeah, but I drove up to the yeah. center in my <laughs> Volkswagen bus. And uh, went in, (laughs) met someone who said, oh, you're here for the retreat. Yes. Well, let me take you to your room. So she walked me upstairs, walked me through these dorm hallways into a room. And in the room, I went to the room. In the room, there was just a foam mattress, on the, a two-inch foam mattress on the floor. That was it. Yes. That was it. Yeah. A bare, you know, dorm room. (laughs) I said, oh, thank you very much. I walked in. I just walked across the room to the window on the wall looking out into the forest out behind IMS. It is a, there's mm-hmm. a kind of a pine forest. And yeah. I had this feeling. I had such a strong feeling. I am going to spend a lot of time here. That wow. was in 77. And I spent yep. from 77 to 85 there. Uh, wow. On staff and doing retreats yearly and on staff and on the board of directors, the executive director, and, and many, many roles there before I went. So what was that, 18 years? 18, is that 18, 18 years there? No, that, no, was, 70, was, that? that was 77 oh, 70 to, to 85, eight. but seven, eight years. Oh, okay, yeah, so eight years. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, so, and so you walked in there thinking you were doing a three-week retreat, yeah. and you'd be there for eight years. And I just, you know, I just ended up pretty much staying you know, I would come and wow. go because I had what? to go back to the commune periodically and do some work and come yeah. back and uh, back and forth. But what made you stay? So what made what made you stay? Like, so you were coming for three weeks and and you had this feeling that you, you know, this feeling overcame you that, you know, you're going to be here, for, you're going to spend some serious time here. But what actually about the place made you stay there? What 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 kept you there? Well, I think the first thing was when I got there to do the work for a work retreat. It was an old building, and they needed a lot of carpentry work and painting and plumbing and electrical. They needed everything. And those were my skills. Mm -hmm. And I just saw that, wow, I I could really contribute here. Useful, yeah. So I was useful. And it was, they were nice people. They were all young people like I was, you know, 25, 26, 27. You Mm -hmm. know, the oldest one might have been 30. I don't know if there was anybody 30 years old, but that's, (laughs) <laughs> we were all of that age. Yeah. And it, we were just, well, it was like a spiritual community. So I have, Did you have a feeling you were doing something special? or mm, what, what, Not special so much as... What was bonding everyone together? It was useful. It was fun. I liked meditating. I liked meditating. I just liked sitting. Yeah. I didn't really, <laughs> I didn't really understand. I, didn't, I wasn't very good at it. And there wasn't many books out. I wasn't reading. I wasn't interested in reading books about meditation or Buddhism or anything like that. I just liked to sit quietly. I think it was a yep. lot of repair, you know, repair work from childhood and education. But yeah, but uh, yeah. So I was there, and I applied to be on staff. And when I went on staff in January of '78, I came on right when a number of other people were coming on staff. 
And we had a yep. very, very close staff uh, for that year, 78. And, mm. you know, half of the people that were on staff at the time are now Dharma teachers. Yeah. You know, Guy Armstrong, uh, Carol Wilson. Oh, yeah. Michelle McDonald, uh, myself, yep. and others. It's just, and we all bonded mm. so was, closely and have been mm. good friends for, well, the next 38 years. Wow. Nice. So that's that's the way it's been and for us. Yeah, that that's nice. So I think it was partly finding and, and a community, finding a community of like-minded people, and being and doing something that I could see was of benefit to more than myself. It wasn't like I was just getting a paycheck. Mm. Yeah, I'd, I'd been doing that, building houses, but this was something yeah. else. Hmm. And then were you, um, so during those years where you were doing a lot of meditation, were you doing a lot of study of Buddhist text or was or no, was that part of it or not at that not stage? Not really, you know. I, I wasn't much of a scholar, still not much of a scholar. Yeah. I, I like mm -hmm. the sitting. I like to just sit uh, quietly and try to be mindful as badly mm -hmm. as I w was at it. Uh, but something <laughs> was, something was, happening within me and during yeah. those years that I was on staff there and around IMS Ajahn Chah came to the meditation center spent some okay, time yeah his holiness the Dalai Lama came to America for the first time and stopped in at IMS Mahasi Sayadaw and a whole series uh, uh, five or six monks came with him and stopped in and spent some time at IMS and Tonpulo mm. Sayadar, another renowned uh, Burmese meditation master, also came to IMS. So I got exposure to all of these. Well, we look at them now as really uh, venerable and grandfathers of the whole For sure. Western Theravada and His Holiness, too. Yeah. So For sure. That's like a who's who of, yeah. you know, the influences on Buddhism <laughs> in America. Yeah. And Mani Manindra came. And Deepama came yep. several times, mm -hmm. and it's just like mm -hmm. th this was just this is just who was around at the time. It, it didn't even mm -hmm. real. I mean, yeah, I realized that oh, this is something special, but I didn't realize that it would become as special as it now seems to be. Yeah, you know, I mean, His and Holiness was the first time he came to America, and it wasn't even a yeah. it wasn't a political trip. It was it was just almost unknown. But mm -hmm. somebody knew him and invited him, and he decided to come. <laughs> Spend a day. <laughs> so. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's wonderful, wonderful time, wonderful time. And then, you know, meeting these teachers, were you like, did did that have an effect on you? Or were you more, no, this is what I'm doing. And did that sort of change anything for you? Well, or? you know, I, when I, when Madajan Cha came to the center, I was kind of intimidated by him. You know, I, I mm. even to go offer him food, you know, when he was having his meal, I was a little bit intimidated. Not that he was a scary guy, but I didn't know what to do. I didn't know anything about bowing and chanting yeah. and, you know, sitting on the floor like that. I, you know, in meals, serving monks, I, I didn't know. So I, I kind of, I participated kind of peripherally, or kind of, uh, you know, on the side, but not very, like, excitedly knowing I was, could get some teachings from him. When Mahasi mm. Sayada came, there was five monks with him, and that was a big, that was a big deal because he was. We were really following in the tradition of the Mahasi Sayadaws, the the method of the practice, the the way we formatted the, the treats and out. things like that. Okay, and, uh, he was, that was a big deal because there were six monks at the time, and that was a so big deal. So, was he considered the like lineage head or like the the father of what you guys were doing, or was this more like an independent? group of people inviting teachers to come and teach them, teach well, the students. The, 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 the center was started, uh, you know, originally by students of Goenka and okay. had wanted yep. uh, Mr. Goenka to come and teach there, but uh, he, would on, he would only come and teach if he could be the only teacher there, which wasn't, okay. wasn't any way to run a retreat center financially solvent in America in 1975. In those days. So yes, that didn't happen. So mm. uh, Jack Joseph Sharon 
Ruth Dennison, John Coleman, and Robert Hover were the teachers of the Theravada tradition, other than Mr. Guenka, who, yeah, and and they were all from the Burmese tradition, uh, either Guenka mm-hmm. tradition, I mean either the Uba Kin tradition or Mahasi tradition, and of course yeah. Joseph had practiced with Manindra, Manindra had studied with yeah. Mahasi Sayadaw. So yeah. that was the kind of the founding tradition of the retreats mm-hmm. and the instruction. There was a lot of influence from Western psychology, from uh, the Ajahn Chah tradition where Jack had been ordained, and then from Deepama and her loving kindness practice. So yeah. those in her jhana practice, her concentration jhana practice and her loving kindness. So those were the influences of the teachers, and quite naturally, that's what became the format and the structure and the instruction of the courses at being offered at IMS. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so it was qu- quite eclectic then. Like it was a eclectic in a narrow range. You know. Um, yeah. It was Theravada. Uh, it was mostly out yeah. of Burma, with some influence from mm-hmm. Ajahn Chah. I would say a lot. Chah. I don't want to minimize that. There was a lot of influence from Ajahn Chah. Yeah. And, uh, but so the format... So Ajahn Chah is the Thai forest tradition, yeah? Yeah, yeah Thai forest tradition. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, then, of course, Jack, Jack was a psychologist by then, and there was a lot of psychological influence. Um, hmm. Western, Western psychological understandings brought to the... Uh, Buddhist teachings and the application of them for individuals mm. in the West, and that was a that was an essential yeah. piece of the success of uh, Western Theravada yeah. teachings, I believe. Yeah. Yes. So, so then you're there eight years, and then is the next move you head off to Burma, and and uh, then what spurred that? Well, let me. During that during that eight years, I'd had a lot yeah. of friends, you know, and. Other, t- uh, other uh, staff members who'd gone off to Burma or Thailand, had ordained mm-hmm. for a year or two, practicing with uh, Ajahn Chah and practicing at the Mahasi Center, or practicing with Ajahn Buddha Dasa, and they'd go for a year mm-hmm. or two and come back and, you know, pick up their life doing whatever they do. And mm-hmm. I never felt, I never felt motivated that way. I just, I, I said, what are, why, are, why are people doing that? I, I don't know. I just like sitting. Yeah. And, uh, yes. but still I felt like, well, there's something going on there that just doesn't resonate with me, but okay, we'll see. You're, you're like, I can sit in America. What's so special about sitting in Thailand or something Burma? Something like that, <laughs> something like that. But there was this one thing that happened. Uh, the first time that Tongpulu Sayadaw came, I think he was the first West, first Burmese monks to come to the West, uh, you know, in the modern time. Yeah. And when yes. I saw him... Now he's the monk who sat, who went in, who practiced uh, concentration in a cave for 33 years, and then wow. he came out, came to America and started teaching. So, you know, uh, what's and what's his like? How does he fit into you know? There's all these teachers. What sort of is he? Was he from Burma? Where, he's what's from his he's from Burma, Burma, and he's a contemporary of Mahasi Sayadaw, and okay. he. He was renowned for being a concentration practice uh, a practitioner, yeah. and because he'd lived in solitary solitarily in a cave for sixteen years, then came out, took care of his abbot's mon- his teacher's uh, monastery when he had passed away. Then he went back in the cave for another seventeen years, and one mm-hmm. of his students was Rena Sarkar. Now, Rena Sarkar mm-hmm. is a Burmese woman who teaches that. Uh, teaches in San Francisco at what used to be the East-West Foundation, and now it's the California Institute for Integral Studies. And so mm-hmm. she taught Buddhism there for many years, and so when she brought her teacher, Tongpulo Sayadaw, to America, then we invited him over to IMS to offer a week-long retreat. So he came. Yes. When I saw him, it was he was the first first monk I'd ever seen. He was, yeah. you know, he was tiny, wizened, old, wearing sunglasses, even in the dark of day, dark of night, he <laughs> lived in a cave. And uh, yes. he, he demonstrated the power of his mind in several ways that was phenomenal. For example... What do you mean? Like, he would have group yeah. interviews in, in, the, uh, in one of the main rooms there. 
And 30 people would come yes. into the room, and he's sitting in his chair, and uh, Rena's sitting beside him on the floor. And he looks around, and he identifies every doctor in the room. And he asks them, are you a doctor? Are you a doctor? Are you a doctor? And they all were yes, <laughs> and none of them were wearing scrubs. Yeah. Wow. And he never made a mistake. So how do you explain, how do you explain that? He practiced concentration practice. The power of a concentrated so was he mind doing is like, infinite. Yeah, so he was doing like jhana meditation in that? Is, yes, that, is yes. that what you mean by concentration but he practice? Was doing, yeah. Yes, concentration uh, jhana practice. But he was doing a 32 parts of the body. So he had a intimate interior knowledge of the body, of the 32 parts of the body. Mm -hmm. Here the head, here the body, all the mucus, phlegm, stuff like that. And he had done that practice for, yeah. you know, 33 years. So he knew his body inside out from the inside. And so I believe, I mean, yes. this, is my, this is my speculative theory. I believe that he had an understanding of the body that is profound and that he could mm. see, he could recognize others who had an understanding of the body as it truly is, like doctors who've done autopsies and opened up cadavers and have yeah. some understanding of what's actually in there. Most of us are kind yes. of totally deceived by the beauty of the appearance in the skin. And uh, so we don't, mm -hmm. we don't really know what's in there. But he did. And in some ways he was able to recognize others who had similar knowledge. That's, how mm. I, that's, what I, that's my theory. And that's so, your, yeah, wow. And then the, you know, the concentrated mind can know things that an ordinary mind yeah. cannot well, know. We, yeah, for sure. And then you, you had some other examples maybe. Well, that was, that was the him. predominant thing. I'd, I'd heard yeah. other stories from others about him and the power of his mind to recognize other people's minds, the quality of other people's minds. Yes. It didn't, it didn't happen to yeah. me. He didn't, he didn't somehow reveal something to me about myself that only I knew. But others yes. had similar experiences like that. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. when I saw him, I felt moved deeply. Something in me moved, shifted. And I couldn't, I didn't articulate it at the time, but only later did I realize I wanted, to put it kind of unspecified, I wanted to be like him. But it's not like I really yes. wanted to be like him. I wanted what he had, meaning yeah. the kind of presence of mind, the kind of stillness of mind, the kind of clarity of mind, the power of mind, whatever it is, that kind of mm. interior, the knowledge of one's interior, mind and body. I wanted that. Yeah. And I think mm -hmm. even then when I first saw him, there was planted the seed in my mind, someday I want to ordain, I want to live like he lived. But yes. I was still, you know, an emotional wreck and still, still in my 20s trying to figure out what life's all about and make a living. And mm. it wasn't until eight years later in 1985 when I actually made the decision to go to Burma and ordain. But I had, hmm. I had kind of gotten myself ready for it, and I felt more prepared for it. And it was a gradual process of acclimating my interior, my mind, my heart and mind, and my practice to that possibility. Yes. Yeah. But the year before I made that decision to go to Burma is when Upandita first came to America. 1984. Okay, yeah. Upandita first came to America. Now... Other Westerners had been to Burma at the Mahasi Center practicing with Mahasi. When he passed away, Upandita, Saito Upandita, was uh, subsequently uh, invited to be the, what they call the uh, presiding teacher there. Because the yes. center is run by a lay organization, lay, lay people, and they invite the monks mm -hmm. to come and teach. So he was the okay. um, pres presiding uh, teacher. And so he was like America. successor? Yeah, successor, yeah. Yeah, Yeah. okay. And uh, I, I don't think in Burma they'd say he was a successor. He was just the person who was invited to, to fulfill the, the teaching role Position. At, that, at the Mahasi Center, you know. Okay, yep. And then, I mean, I think that's a subtlety, but uh, yeah, we no. would understand it as successor, yes. Yes, okay. So he came to America, and he was going to be, he was invited to teach a three-month retreat for just 20 students, 
at IMS. And the 20 students mm -hmm. were all teachers or students who yep. were practicing well and were going to be teachers. We're clearly on the track to be yes. teachers. Mm -hmm. But I had been involved at IMS for seven or eight years up to that point, and I'd held every position and was on the board and as an executive director and started the, the Dharma Seed Tape Library uh, program or helped oversee the start of that. And so I yes. wanted to do this retreat. I was not a teacher, and nobody had any mm. delusion that I was ever going to be a teacher. But I just said, <laughs> you know, I really would like to do that retreat. So I guess because yeah. of my service to IMS, they allowed me to do the retreat. <laughs> so <laughs> I did. And the retreat was one of those watershed moments for a lot of people of just like, oh, yeah. this is how you can practice. Oh, my gosh. And, and, you know, there were some people that did very well. Other people were, like, totally put off by that style of practice or the style of reporting to him. I tried hard. Okay. I made good effort. I made probably too much effort. I didn't do anything dramatic or special uh, as far as practice. Mm. But Upandita, as I had had been told that everybody was doing the, that was doing the retreat was a teacher or was going to be a teacher. So when I went to see him yes. for my last, <laughs> I went to see him for my last <laughs> interview before I left, and I said, you know, um, thank you very much. I've worked hard. I've done my best, and. I would, uh, you know, uh, I'm, I'm going to be going back to my home. And he looked at me and he said, you know, he said, you should not teach. <laughs> if you'd like to share your experiences of practice, that, was, that would be okay. But you should not teach. <laughs> so I, I got it. I mean, I was, I was not aspiring to teach. That was not my, yes. you know, I didn't have any. But somebody forgot to tell him that I wasn't, <laughs> nobody was selecting me to teach. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, anyway, so I went back home, or I went back to where I was living in Western Massachusetts yeah. at the time, and um, went to work, went back to work, uh, building, I uh, was doing big, a major renovation of a house. And, yeah. you know, that was, it, that was in August, or July, I guess. And then the next January, I was doing a self-retreat back at IMS over my birthday when I always did a retreat. And I thought I was done. That three-month course was so hard and so yeah. difficult for me. What was hard about it? It's, difficult physically? Yeah, it's, it's painful. Oh. It's just slow. It's very yeah. meticulous noting. It's the continuity of mindful awareness is just extraordinary. And I, yeah. along with everybody else, was crawling around this place at snail's pace for three months. And your yeah. reporting is just uh, reporting the exact experience that you had without any embellishment, without any story behind it. It's just, what did you see? What happened when you noticed it? And how did it change? What happened to it? What'd you do next? What'd you notice next? And that's it for three yep. months. That was just grueling. There was just no, there was no storytelling involved in it at all. It was just raw observation and reporting of what's observed. Wow. Wow. So that was, I mean, and we all, we all, I mean, Jack, Joseph, Sharon, they were all doing it as well as other teachers and, and senior mm -hmm. students. So it just was grueling. And, and this, this was, was a new level for, for most, of peop, most of the people doing this? Yeah, was yeah, this like yeah. a new level of practice? Yeah. Well, it was a different, yeah, yeah it was a new intensity different. of practice. Of course, you know, Joseph and Sharon had been practicing for years and teaching for years at that point, teaching for... Ten years yes. practicing. Joseph was practicing for eight years before, seven or eight years before that. So he's got fifteen. Or so, do you think Sayadaw Upandita had done this similar thing with Mahasi Sayadaw? Is this like, is this was was this what he was doing? Um, this is this how he trained, or is this how he thought that these Westerners who want to be teachers need to train? No, I think Upan Sayadaw Upandita. He he taught that course and laid out the expectations for how to report as the way he did and with everybody that was in Burma. He didn't, he didn't do something special yeah. for that course. I think that, okay. uh, you know, he was not, I mean, he, he's very demanding in his practice. He just gets you to practice yeah. in a way that is, you know, just by the power of his own mind to instruct and guide and uh, to uh, elicit your 
utmost effort, which may not always be skillful effort, but a lot of effort. Yeah. And so was he a student? Sorry, yeah, was, was he a student of Mahasi Sayadaw, or was he just fulfilling that um, place at, as no, a teaching he, position? he was involved at the Mahasi Center, and I'm not sure what his role was. He might have been a, a teacher, a guy, a teacher teaching okay. the meditation. Because the Mahasi okay. Sayadaw Center, the Mahasi Sasana Yekta, was very popular, and there was just hundreds of thousands, of, tens of thousands, oh, hundreds of thousands okay. of people going there, you know, continuously, and there were more than 400 Mahasi centers in Burma, you know, monks who would come, practice, yes. then go back to their community and start teaching that method. You know, wow. and so there was a lot of people coming to uh, the main center in Rangoon. And so they needed a lot of teachers. So this was a movement in, this was a movement in Burma itself? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Then. Yeah. yeah, okay. You know, there's yeah. been some recent history uh, of how it all happened that lay people were practicing so much in Burma, which made it possible for Manindra, as a lay person from India, yeah. to go to uh, Mahasi Center and stay for eight years and practice, practice and study. So Ma you know, Manindra was a student of Mahasi Sayadaw. Manindra, Man Manindra was a student of Mahasi Sayadaw, yes. And, and also Goenka, am I right? A, no, Goenka was a student of um, Uba Kin. Ubak oh, I thought Manindra was a student of Goenka, but uh, maybe I have that wrong. No, Manindra, Manindra is Indian and Goenka is Indian, and they they were good yes. friends, and they were both Dharma Dharma students and Dharma practitioners and Dharma teachers, extraordinary, and so they were good friends. Yes. And in fact, Manindra stayed at uh, Goenka's center for a number of years in his elder years. Got it. But they were got it uh, contemporaries. Yeah, contemporaries. Got it. Got it. Yeah, and so. Mm. You know, that Upandita, I think, when he came to America, well, he was the, it was his first trip to America, and he was, he was just checking it out. He got a lot of pushback. He got a tremendous amount of confrontation with, by women. From, from who? Well, women, for one thing, oh. you know, because he was very, segregate the women from the men, and, you know, the women said over there, yeah. and the men said over there, and we'd never done that. And, you know, some <laughs> of the, you know, mon mon monastic rules you know, can be seen by uh, as being uh, either misogynistic or, you know, kind yeah. of not not supporting women or, or anti-feminine or anti-body, yeah, you know, anti-physical, sensual, sensual. Yeah. Uh, and that's, yeah. you know, that's monastic and Theravada territory. And so he got yes. some, he got a lot of questions and pushback around stuff like that. But he was... You know, he was just getting introduced to Westerners, and he's you know yes. he's a very traditional, orthodox, uh, fundamental Theravada Buddhist monk since he was seven yeah. or eight. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, he's just expressing what he's learned, and uh, you know, yeah. but then he's he has learned to um, articulate that skillfully, anticipating you know. Yeah. I think some some of the pushback that he or recognizing some of the pushback he'd gotten, but he didn't back off of his understanding at all. Mm -hmm. And and an interesting thing, just to add a point here about the perception of Western Western women's perception of the kind of the cultural or the monastic or the Theravada dissing of the feminine or women in particular mm -hmm. or whatever. In yeah. Burma, Saito Pandita has a huge uh, city center. He has a huge forest center. He has several other uh, centers spread around Burma. They're all, yeah. all of the main people, all of the teachers, of the, all the people that run it, the people who organize it, run it, they're all women and nuns. He gives, really? women, he gives women and nuns the, you know, the, absolute best positions that they can be given in the Theravada yep. tradition in Burma. And they are And they are teachers as well? So They don't, so teach, they like... don't teach the meditation. They, they teach some of the meditation to some people, but for okay. the most part, monks yep. do that. But as far okay, as yep. teaching Pali, his, his students, his, his nuns, are number one mm -hmm. or two, one and or two in the country every year in the national exams. Yes. He's just, he's just yep. very demanding and He's such a high standard that people come from all over to practice 
and study with him. Practice with. They know yeah. a lot is expected of them. Mm-hmm. So, so then you were you so you you had this so he so he basically said yeah maybe you should share your experiences, and then did he leave back to Burma and you yes. you started you went back to your life trying and yep. and then what happened next for you because you end up in Burma yeah. studying under him right yeah so I thought I was done after that three months I was cooked I was like <laughs> I'm done I'm not this isn't working for me any better than it was before yeah. I'm going back to I'm going back to my, um, what would you call it, early adult, middle class <laughs> life, you know. Yeah. So and it, it was in January, which is what, six or seven months later, I was doing a self-retreat at the meditation center. Yeah. And about the third or fourth day into the retreat, I just got this feeling. It was just a feeling. You know what? I don't want to live like this. Hmm. I don't want to live this middle class, acquisitive, you know, treadmill life. Yeah. I just don't want to do it. And instantly, it wasn't like I had to reflect on it or make a decision or anything. It's just like, I'm going, I'm done, I'm going. And in some ways, I think my, my initial aspiration of seven or eight years earlier to follow Tongpu Lusaida kind of came to fruition. Now I had yeah. some understanding, I uh, had a little more practice, I had a little more Dharma understanding, and yeah. you know, I, went back, I went back home at the end of that retreat and told my partner at the time, I'm sorry, I'm going to Burma. I'm wow. going to go ordain. S- I wanted to go, I, wow. I, I had several reasons. One was I wanted to practice until I really felt like I, pra- I knew what I was doing. I really still, even mm-hmm. after eight years, of practice. I didn't feel like I really got it. So I really yeah. wanted to find out what what is this what is this practice all about? So that was one thing. And uh, the second yep. thing is I wanted to live in a Buddhist country. I wanted to see what it was like if everybody in the country was Buddhist or practicing or what I thought mm-hmm. was practicing. Mm-hmm. And then mm-hmm. I wanted to ordain. I wanted to live as a monk. So the only yep. person I knew over there was Upandita. So I went to Burma, and you know, wow. I, I, Can I closed up shop, turned away, you know, got out of a couple of contracts I had for doing carpentry work, and separated from my partner, put everything in storage, and took off with a one-way ticket and head off. Yeah, head off. And then, can I ask? I'm I'm fascinated by something. So you had this experience with this first Sayadaw monk, which was really inspiring in your your um sort of reaction to that having met him was I want to be I want what he's got and he was doing these very focused concentration meditations right yeah and then later down the track you meet um, Sayadaw Pandita Mm -hmm. and you're doing this very rigorous um, three month insight sort of practice yes with uh, you're calling them interviews right yeah Uh, and so and the reaction from that was, wow, I'm done, sort yeah, of thing. Yeah. I'm cooked. And, <laughs> and th- I'm cooked, you know, burn out. Like, if this yeah. is what it is, this is, this yeah. is. And then, but then something must have been planted in you. So when you go, you're doing a self, and then it arises in you, and you're like, I want to be, I want to go to Burma, and I want to be a monk, yeah. right? Yeah. And you end up at, did you, do you end up, um, going to Sayadaw Upandita's place. Yes. And I find that a fascinating choice because of the reaction to that practice versus the reaction to the earlier Sayadaw yeah. who was doing a different practice. So so is there do you do you, there's a question in there somewhere but yeah, yeah, <laughs> but I'll do you get you, a sense of what yeah, I'm yeah, asking? Yeah. No, I get it. Yeah. Uh, here's what happened. The only uh, many of my friends had gone to uh, Thailand and had ordained and mm-hmm. so I understood that oh yeah you can go to Thailand you can ordain and you can wander in the forest you can go on your arms round through the rice fit patties every morning and that's great and it was living in the yeah. living in the forest just kind of uh, in the jungle that sounded great but I knew that there were two different uh, monastic traditions in Burm- in uh, Thailand and if you belonged to one you couldn't go to monasteries of the other 
So I said, oh, I know yes. how to get around that. I'll go ordain in Burma. And if I get a Burmese <laughs> ordained, then I can go to both in Thailand. But that's not the, that's not the way it Very works good. either. But And the only person yeah. I knew over there was uh, Upandita, so, Sayur Upandita. So I went there. Yeah. And yes. I... You know, I didn't really plan on staying. I didn't plan on staying there. I thought I was just going to ordain and spend a few months and then go over to Thailand and yeah. live happily in the jungle. Well, yeah. when I got to the Mahasi Center, Mahasi Sasana Yekta, you know, the schedule is, you know, you wake up at 3, you sit and walk alternate mm. hours, and you go to bed at 11. You can sleep, as Upandita mm. says, you can sleep all you want between 11 and 3. <laughs> and that's the schedule, and they were serious. They weren't, there was not cutting it short at all. It was, that's the way it was. And, and how but, long, is that just like continuously like that, or is that like continuously, during periods of time? No, no, wow. that's, that's continuously. And, so you but, could live like ye- for years like that? In fact, and they I did. do, I guess. In fact, I did. Oh, you did? Yeah. Wow. Because I was so fired up. At that point, I was so fired up. I was so determined, so resolved that... I am going to yeah. I'm going to practice to find out what this is all about. Yeah. And you know, it wasn't anything he wasn't different over there than he was in America, you know, a couple of years before. Or this cuz yes. this was in I got there in December of 85. And mm-hmm. uh you know, he started me practicing and I was so determined in 2 weeks my practice was phenomenal. Phenomenally different. Phenomenal. What does that mean? Oh, phenomenally different than different. anything I'd ever experienced yeah. before. So how how like so I'm interested in this because you said um, you were you know you had these eight years living at a retreat center meditating and you didn't even after eight years eight years you didn't really feel like you'd gotten it or you were doing you didn't know that you were doing it right no. you didn't have that sense no. you knew you were doing something and you were you must have felt some sort of sense of getting better at something, but you didn't know if you're doing it right. So at this point, did you feel like I am now doing it right, or or what makes you say that? What had changed? Oh gosh, you know, I think I I, I mean I'm going to have to use Dharma language, but I think what actually happened sure. is I got free of my reactive tendencies of mind for sustained periods of time where I could just observe the flow of life go by without liking, disliking, reacting, frustrated, disappointed, whatever, without those reactions. Mm. Those things, I just escaped the grip of my conditioning, uh, you know, in some ways, temporarily for sustained periods of time. And then what happens is I could see the activity of the mind as just the activity of the mind. Not my mind. Yes. It's just the mind. This is what the mind does. Yeah. And that was yeah. just like phenomenal. That was just like, oh my God, whoever would, who could ever imagine that this is what's, what it's like behind the stories of my life? Yes. You know, we're, so, we're so entangled and we're so caught up in the stories of my life. We don't really see the activity of mind as going into making up those stories. Was that um, change like self-evident or as yeah. something that was an important stage? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. I'll yeah. tell you why. Because at that, at that point, the m- continuity of mindful awareness was so continuous that mm. what happens at that point, and now I'm going to be talking a little bit about the Mahasi uh, progress of insight. At that point, yeah, that, be great. all of the, what, what we call spiritual goodies, started to arise. Now, spiritual yeah. goodies are the things that we're all looking for when we first start practice. You know, serene yeah. bliss, ecstasy, joy, clarity, piercing knowledge, yeah. you know, phantasmagoria, psychedelia, all that kind of stuff that, that we hope happens, you know, when you, pra- when you start yeah. practicing. Yes. And it all comes, of course. If you practice well, all of yeah. that stuff comes. Extraordinary, unshakable yes. faith. You know, effortless energy. Uh, supreme tranquility where you're just unmoving. The continuity of mm-hmm. awareness that is just unbroken for sustained periods of times. 
the piercing knowledge of how clearly you can know your experience moment after moment. And equanimity, you know, just this non-reactive, this, this balanced state of mind that can see pleasant, unpleasant, without reacting to it. Well, these are... Yes. I mean, when you start having these kind of experiences, something's happening. You, it's not like you're yeah. thinking something's happening. You're being moved by these experiences. Yeah. You know, so that when, when piti, this joy, arises, it's, it's yeah. like ecstasy. You know, it arises in different mm. forms, but eventually it gets to ecstasy, where it's just pass out ecstasy. Yeah. Now, I'd, I'd done yeah. plenty of drugs, of, of the <laughs> recreational drugs before I got there, but the kinds of spiritual goodies that I was experiencing was above and beyond all those drug experiences. Similar yeah. in, in content, wow. similar in affect or energetic stuff at times, but... Yeah. You know, I realized, wow, this is this is the mind. This is the mind. Yeah. It's not like you don't have to take drugs. If you look at the mind. Yes. I mean, and the drug experience is not something to just indulge in. It's to show you your mind. Once you're seeing your mind, then you know what mm. the work is that you got to do. Okay. Yes. So just taking drugs is very dissipating and de- debilitating. And so when you dispersing. when you were having these experiences of pity and sukha mm. and these blissful states, mm. were you were you um, did you reflect on you know previous you know after the fact of course did you reflect on like re- were you relating those sort of experiences to uh, previous experiences on on drugs and different types of chemical substances were you do you did you do you think they are the same, or were you thinking that they were different, or I, how, did, how did you compare I them? I didn't or really. Was that something not uh, even? You know, I wasn't. I realized, oh, this is this is similar to taking LSD, or this is similar to psilocybin, mm-hmm. or this is similar to what at the time was called Adam, which is ecstasy, MDMA, and oh, yeah. you know stuff like that. And I thought, oh, this is this is like that, but my mind yeah. was not indulging in it as a recreational uh, kind of fun time and yeah. because there was no drug involved and no illegality involved and there was no that it's a lot more yeah. stabilizing the, all these experiences are much more stable in the mind and so yeah. you know it's just your mind it's, it's not because you took a drug it's not because you're, you're yeah. doing anything and so you don't have that edginess you didn't have that I didn't any yes. kind of edginess. It was yeah. just a very somber, not somber, but a very stable experience rather than chaotic experience. And then now talking about the method a little bit, which may be different, are you trying to do something? Like what's the insight practice in relation to those experiences in this, in the Mahasi mm. method? Or are you just uh, non-judgmentally there? What, what, what are you trying to do? Well, with you know, when the, those things arise. Yeah, you know, the practice is to just notice what arises, pay attention to it, see what happens yeah. to it. Notice what rises next, see, pay attention to it. Yeah. See what happens. Of course, when ecstasy starts arising or bliss or you know mm-hmm. any of those, you know, extraordinary states, it's very difficult to just not indulge in them, to not get excited by them, to not think, oh my God, this is mm-hmm. fantastic. You know, yes. and so for for some number of days, weeks, months, you know, those things would continue to catch the mind and get entangled in it, and I would get entangled in mm-hmm. them with with you know some kind of pride or some kind of attachment or some kind of indulgence, and it wasn't mm-hmm. until I just kept going, kept noticing, kept noticing that those those um, what the, what are called pseudo nibbana or the spiritual goodies. Yes. Kind of, uh, I could be more <laughs> balanced about them. I didn't, I didn't have to indulge in them. They would come, but so what? You know, it's just, it's just ecstasy. Mm. It's just bliss. It's just, you know, effortless energy. So what? You know, it's just one moment's mm. experience followed after another. That's all it ever is. Um, mm. So then, that's when the path stabilizes. That's when you really stabilize in understanding. Oh, the path of practice is to just notice the present moment's experience no matter how okay. difficult, as it was in the first years, or how blissful and extraordinary it was with these kinds of experiences. And neither one yeah. is to be indulged in. It's just... So then what's the role... Oh, sorry, go, go, on, go on. No, no, that's... Uh, well, so what's the role of the... Te- like, so if the practice is just noticing, 
What's the role of the interview and the teacher? The, 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 what Saito Upandita would do is you'd report these experiences, and inevitably mm-hmm. you, would dis, you would convey or display your chagrin, frustration, disappointment when it's difficult, and you would display your mm. excitement, enjoyment, indulgence if it was pleasant. And so yes. he, would, he would temper your reaction Whatever it was, he would offer a guidance or instruction to kind of uh, encourage or inspire or, you know, to instruct if you were down in the dumps. And he would kind mm-hmm. of uh, subdue your enthusiasm and your indulgence and your, uh, you know, your, your pride if you were caught up in that, if you were inflated. And so he, he doesn't yeah. do it so much in the interview as he does in the Dharma talk that he gives that night. Okay. So he, didn't, okay. he, doesn't, he doesn't put you down face to face. Yeah. But he yes. talks about those experiences in the Dharma talk at night, and you see, oh, <laughs> and he talks about people indulging in these, you know, ec- ecstasy and bliss and stuff <laughs> like that. And he says, this is not the way to practice. This is, you know, this is some Very form skillful. of pride or whatever, attachment, and really you just have to notice that. And so... You get it. You get you get the message, but not because he's yeah. shaming you or admonishing you or he's instructing you. And you get to yes. see the insight. You get the insight for yourself that this is the way it is. Yes. Yeah. Got it. So very skillful. Very cool. Mm-hmm. Mm. So then you spent five years or in well, do, with yeah as a monk and mm-hmm. yeah go on. You know, I, I, I really, you know, after, like I said, after the first two weeks, I was like, wow, in rare territory. And uh, yeah. I practiced that way for several years. And uh, at some point, he asked me, you know, I, my practice was pretty good. Uh, you know, the mm-hmm. continuity of mindfulness is really good. So at some point, he said, uh, you know, would you like to learn, uh, would you like to practice the Brahma Viharas, Metta, loving kindness and c- compassion? Yeah to, to uh, practice jhanas. And I wasn't really yes. interested at the time that he first asked me. But then a number of other teachers came, Jack, uh, no, Joseph and Sharon, and a few other people came to practice the Brahma Viharas and loving kindness and for jhanas with him. And so then I said, okay, if mm-hmm. they're going to do it, I'll do it too. And so mm-hmm. then I practiced um, Brahma Viharas for, you know, kusala, or the development of the heart, as well as yeah. for the development of concentration or jhana. And, you know, I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't know how long, I didn't have any plan to stay a year or two or a year and a half or whatever. I just ended up yeah. staying five years. It's just kind of, mm-hmm. you know, accidental, um, almost. I mean, mm-hmm. I kept doing it. And I, and I practiced that way, you know, following that schedule for probably four four of those five years. Mm-hmm. And I had to do, I had to go out of the country and get a visa and come back in, and I traveled to Australia with him, and I met a monk there who I later went back and pract- studied the uh, Abhidhamma with, uh, a, monk, okay. a Burmese monk there. But, yeah. you know, so I, I, I basically was ordained for a little more than five years, and then mm-hmm. after four or some years, I decided I really didn't want to stay in Burma as a as a kind of a token Western foreign monk in any monastery. Yeah. I really wanted to come back to yeah. the West. I wasn't, you know, I, I didn't really know what I'd do, but people were interested in what I had done. And I must say, Joseph and Sharon were very encouraging. You know, if, if I wanted to come back, they would offer me a place to stay at IMS, and there was a little cottage there that I could stay in as a monk. And I was, yes. I was welcomed, you know, for what I had been doing. And so I, I, you know, eventually made a decision to return to the West. And after some months, I decided to disrobe. I knew I would disrobe. It wasn't like I didn't yeah. know. I knew I was going to disrobe. Yes. And as soon as I did, or as soon as it became known I was disrobing, I got invitations to teach, and that's what I've been doing for 25 years, teaching wow. what I'd learned there. And. And was that transition, what was that transition like going from <laughs> monastery, monk, to then teacher in the West? <laughs> well, you know, somebody had told me earlier that 
for as long as you've been a monk, it'll take you that many years to readjust to Western <laughs> lay society. And I thought, oh, that's yeah. ridiculous. I'm just myself. I'm just myself. I'm, <laughs> I'm who I was then and now. And, you know, but it took about five years. You know, I was teaching. I was wow. traveling and teaching. And, you know, I, I, knew yeah. the, I, knew the, I knew the ropes of conducting retreats because I'd been at IMS for so long. And yeah. uh, I just got lots of invitations. And as soon as I got, you know, after, even in my first year, there were so many people coming to retreats that I needed someone to teach with me. And so mm. I asked, uh, I'd, I'd met Kamala Masters uh, on a retreat when she was a yogi and I was a monk with Saito Bandita. And I knew she was a mm. good student, really good student. And so mm. I, I just called her up and said, hey, you know, I'm, I'm teaching now and I really need somebody to help teach with me. Would you like would you like would you consider it and so i mm. i gave her a tryout for a weekend a three-day weekend at cloud mountain retreat center in uh, southern yeah. washington and uh, she did very well i mean she's you know she's got really good practice and she's just very sincere and honest and very loving and wise woman so we hit it off really well teaching so I said yeah. you know on that three days so I said you know if you'd like to teach uh, I will invite you to, sh to to teach with me every retreat that I teach and so we started wow. teaching together and, and uh, she was you know I said you do half the talks half the instructions and uh, you know you, you can consider yourself a teacher you don't have to do any training or I'm not I'm not going to train you to teach yeah. You, you've, you've got your own yeah. practice and experience, and uh, you just share that. And yeah. so we, we, we've taught together for 20-some years. Wow. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. So that's, that was a great partnership, great yeah. partnership. Yeah. And then, um, and then so, so is this something, you know, and now you're working on books. Is that something that you saw coming or? No. And we, and, of course, we're going to talk about um, Manual of Insight by Mahasi Sayadaw, which uh, Wisdom is honored to be publishing, mm. and um, mm. you're the managing editor for that. So I was just wondering about how that book came, that project came around, and how you came to be working yeah. on that. You know, I left Burma in uh, 90, <laughs> I can't remember, 90... 91, I guess, or disrobed in 91. Mm -hmm. And I didn't go back to Burma for a number of years. Uh, I was just teaching. But when I did go back in 2000, I took Kamala there to Burma for the first time to go practice with Saito Bandita. And I met mm -hmm. a former monk that I had known when I was there, and I asked him what he was doing. And he said, oh, he's, you know, former monks have a hard time doing anything because they're just not educated <laughs> in the ways of the world. But he was, he'd been asked to edit a translation of what he said was Vipassana Shunichan, which is the mm -hmm. Manual of Insight, or what we're calling the Manual mm -hmm. of Insight. It's the way of, the way yes. of Vipassana is really what it, how yes. it's called. And I said, what, what do you mean? There's a book called The Way of Vipassana that hasn't been translated <laughs> into English? And he said, yeah, no, this, this, this book has never been published in English. And I said, you've got to be kidding. I said, this is, this is what we've been doing for 20 years. And <laughs> it seems to me like it ought to be, you know, translated and published and available in the West. He said, yeah, it, it, it would mm. be good. So I said, okay, I, I will give you a stipend, a monthly stipend to translate that book. He tried to yeah. edit some, uh, someone else's translation. And it was so poorly translated that he couldn't do it. So he just started. And he was yes. in the first chapter. So I said... Okay, I'll just give you a monthly stipend, and for him to have a monthly stipend in Burma of you know, hundred hundred U.S. dollars was phenomenal, and so yes. he translated it for us. And when I got his chapter by chapter in English, I realized, wow, this is, this is good. This is this is a depth or a kind of dharma material and understanding of the dharma, understanding of mindfulness, understanding of vipassana or insight that's not available in the West. Hmm. Yes, the Western teachers may have practiced that, practiced in a way that would 
confirm all that was in there, but the, the material wasn't available and they weren't teaching it, teaching from that method, or from that depth of understanding. So I really got yeah. behind the idea of this should be available in the West. So mm. I and some of my students, who I thought had really good practice, like Kamala and Deborah Ratner, uh, Helzer, and we just started editing it. You know, editing his English. His English wasn't that good. Yeah. But putting it into readable yeah. English. And after yeah. we'd gotten that done, I offered a short course um, in, at the Barry, Studies for Buddhist, Barry Center for Buddhist Studies. I'd offered a five-day course introducing that book. And one of the people who took the course was this nun, this Swiss nun, Ariya Nyani. And she mm -hmm. had lived in Burma for 10 or 10 or 15 years at that point, and had new Burmese and translated for another one of the Burmese sayadahs. And she read our excerpt that we had prepared for that course, and she said, oh, there's a lot of mistakes here, because she knew the book oh, wow. in Burmese. She said, there's yeah. a lot of mistakes here. Yeah. And she just showed me a few mm -hmm. on a few pages, like, oh, this should really be said this way, and that should be said that way. And I realized right then, I said, wow, this, this is a vast improvement. This would be a vast improvement over what we have from this former monk, so I asked yes. her. I asked her then. I said, "Would you, would you go through? Would you retranslate this book, or would you take the translation and correct it?" Yes. And she agreed to. So, Kamala and I brought her to Ma Maui, and set her up in a cottage here. And I don't know if it was three months or six months. Every day, she was. She had the book. And she had the computer, and she had the dictionaries, Burmese dictionary, Pali dictionary, English dictionary. And every day she would do some correcting of the translation, and I'd go over it and edit it with her. And we did that, so we got a, another version to work with. And this was, geez, I don't know, probably 10 years ago. And then, wow. you know, we kept working on it, uh, improving it, editing it, uh, refining it. Uh, developing a glossary, tracking down all the uh, source material for all the Pali quotes that, Pali language quotes that Mahasi Sayadaw had included, which was not easy yep. because most of them aren't translated into English. And the citations yes. that he used were for Burmese editions of the commentaries, the subcommentaries, and those Burmese editions are useless in the West because nobody can read them. So we had to find yes. <laughs> those citations in what are readily available Roman script um, copies of the commentary, subcommentaries, discourses. And so it was just yeah. this massive undertaking to document everything that was in the book. Now, I'd been talking to Saito Bandita about this, and he thought, oh, that's a good idea to translate this book. But then he would throw in this thing, you know, yeah, you should, inc yeah, you should include all the Pali quotes in the book. And I just thought, oh, that's just going to put everybody out. Nobody's going to want to read a book that's just full of poly quotes. So I made the decision, yes. well, we'll put them in the back. We'll put them in the, in the, as an appendix in the back. But even yeah. then, it was, you know, there's, I don't know how many pages, you know, it's just poly quotes. There's 599 yes. poly quotes in the book. So, and there's, some of them are long. So there's a lot of yeah. <laughs> pages devoted. And I didn't think any <laughs> publisher would want to publish that. But yeah. that was the requirement. You know, from Saito, yeah. or that was the suggestion. And he explained it because he said, you know, there are scholars that are going to want to challenge or check what Mahasi Saito has said about yeah. the practice of mindfulness and vipassana and insight and the nature of nibbana and the progress of insight and all those. This is what the book's about. And so yeah. we, he said, there are scholars. And I said, yeah, but not many people speak or study Pali. And he said, some do, and maybe in the future many will. Yeah. And so I got it. Yeah. So we made the commitment, and we did that. Yeah. And I, the other thing I was going to say is, so much of what Mahasi Sayadaw references in his teaching is directly from the Abhidhamma. And the Abhidhamma yeah. is just, you know, the, the, the monks, the monastic order in Burma are Abhidhammas. They're, they're, they're all into the Abhidhamma. Yes. And while... You know, we might say the Buddha didn't teach the Abhidhamma. Certainly, the understanding of the Buddha's teachings is is encoded in the Abhidhamma, and so yeah. that they use they reference the Abhidhamma a lot. 
and there's not much knowledge among Western Dharma practitioners of the Abhidhamma. And so, mm-hmm. uh, you know, frankly, a lot of Westerners could read the book, but they wouldn't understand much because they didn't yeah. have the Abhidhamma knowledge. So what I did is put together some charts, some tables of Abhidhamma information as yeah. appendices to refer to when reading the book so that you could understand yes. what is he actually talking about. Yeah. And so so you, you can have these tables alongside when you're reading through the book. Yes. And there will be places that you need, I think, you need that because you can't, you can't hold it all in your mind yeah. or know what the heck he's talking yeah, about. Yeah, I think we're going to... We've actually, we've actually made the tables a pull-out yeah. And I think we're going to actually have let people download them as well. So you could download and print it out as well. And oh, then as great. you're reading the manual, you, as you're reading the manual, you can track along in the table, oh, this, this mental factor. Oh, yeah. okay, then now this mental factor. Yeah, yeah. I think it's going to be really, really something nice for people who, you know, it's there, the teachings are there now. And, and if you want to dig deeper, mm-hmm. there's, this, there's the quotes and, and, and there's these tables for people yeah. to support people's learnings. Yeah. So it's fantastic. Yeah, it's it's it. This so, is this is not an easy read book. You know, this is uh, no. This is a book to put you to sleep at night. <laughs> yeah. But, so who do you think the books like? Yeah, I was going to ask. Um, I was going to ask when Mahasi Sayadaw wrote the book. Who was he writing it for? Well, he wrote the book in 1945, I think. Mm. It, it was during during the occupation of uh, Burma by the Japanese, and the Japanese were mm-hmm. bombing. You know. Shuebo, which is just eight miles from his monastery where he was housed. And it gave him a time, gave him a period of time to get away from his teaching responsibilities and to go back to wait out the war in his monastery in the countryside. And that's where he wrote the book. Mm-hmm. And I think it was written, it's one of the few books that he actually wrote rather than talks that he gave that were transcribed and made into a book. It's a scholastic yeah, book. Yeah, which makes this book, this makes this book special. It's not a transcription of a talk, which many of, you know, there's, there's quite a few Mahasi Sayadaw books, but this actually is one that uh, he wrote for it to be a book, right? Yeah, right. It was to just be a written. manual. Yeah. To be a manual. He wrote it out in seven months, and uh, I think it was for monastics and for lay people. A lot of Burmese lay people read Dharma books a lot. And they have a they have a, mm. a, lot, a lot of appreciation for the Abhidhamma also, so they could they could read it and understand it. But there's enough Pali references in there for serious scholars too, if they want to do that. But there's also very practical uh, instructions for practice. And even Mahasi Sayadaw said, you know, if you're not a scholar, you just read chapter four and five. That'll be that's enough. If you just if you just have chapter five, and you really practice as in as the instructions say in chapter five, you can you can finish the path. Yeah, and that was the well, so one chapter anyone, that was translated, you know, and, and available some years ago. But yeah, mm-hmm. so anyone listening, if they like, feel overwhelmed by these Abhidharma, uh, what we've described with all these charts, they could just pick the book up and read chapters four and five and get something very valuable out of. Sure. They could they could get material. something really valuable out of any of the chapters, but chapter five is the yeah. one that offers the instructions and a kind of narrative of of someone who's pra- what it's like to practice from the beginning days mm-hmm. and stages up through progress of practice, progress of the insight, and up to uh, attaining first stage of an, of, of enlightenment. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Wow, I think we could talk all day about uh, these <laughs> meditation and these texts. Uh, is there anything in particular you think people um, you know, should know about the book, or is there anything else you would like to share um, before we yeah. I think, I think, finish up? You know, the, I think the motivation for the work that we did over the 15 years from 2000 mm-hmm. to now is really to have... A, a very orthodox and accurate record of the foundational teachings of mindfulness leading to insight and the awakening of enlightenment. And it's very mm-hmm. orthodox. It's uh, Therav- orthodox Theravada. You know, no, I'm no apologies for that. But <laughs> it's, it's all based on mindfulness. Now, mindfulness has really caught on as a secular, uh, skillful, psychological, emotional application. 
And yeah. there are, you know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people practicing some form, some degree of mindfulness. Mm. If they mm. understood the greater value of what mindfulness could do for them through the practice of insight, that would be transformative in their life and in, in, a, in, a, in a larger scale. And this book yeah, has I think the that's very capacity to do that. Do that. I think that's very valuable what you're saying because there's going to be a lot of people listening who have um, come across, you know, the Wisdom Podcast through mindfulness, you know, the more secular mindfulness mm -hmm. practice. Mm -hmm. And uh, so what does it mean, like, when you say that um, if they could, you know, you, what, what are they doing that, um, like, if Sayadaw Pandita, you know, was to comment on the mindfulness movement in the West, what do you think he would say about it? Oh, I, I'll let and him, speak for, I'll he let him speak for himself, really. But yes. I think that, uh, you know, I think it's pretty clear that a lot of the secular applications of mindfulness are good for, you know, very, um, you know, mindfulness-based stress reduction, mindfulness-based relapse prevention yeah. for depression, mindfulness-based addiction, uh, for addictions of one sort or another. There's just a lot of skillful and beneficial yeah. uses for mindfulness. And... Um, it's really using mindfulness kind of to address, uh, you know, problems or what's wrong or, you know, the kind of the pathological nature of our mind at times. What the potential mm -hmm. for insight is, is to take a well-established uh, mind to even greater development of mind. Not mm -hmm. just being... Uh, not just addressing pathological conditions, emotional distress of one sort or another, but to, to mm -hmm. enhance and to develop the wholesomeness, the, the superior qualities of mind that are possible. What, what do you mean by that? Are you like talking about Abhidharma wholesome qualities? No. Or is, like, how would you put that in the normal language? Uh, how to, uh, how to you develop, say... you know, kindness, compassion, well-being, uh, mm -hmm. how to develop your full potential, how to... Uh, how to respond to how to respond to the world with appreciation, with gratitude. How to live lightly on the earth. How to have uh, mm -hmm. harmonious relationships, uh, not just dealing with difficult emotions, but how to have positive emotions. You know, yes. the whole yep. uh, positive psychology, if you will, uh, that's possible. Yes, and and to really yep. come from a place in your life of a sense of well-being, abundance, gratitude, no matter what, how, what the conditions of your life are. You know, there mm -hmm. are people living in, in very difficult situations who are very, very happy. They have very yes. little, but they have, a, you know, they have a lot of heart. They have a lot of happiness. Mm -hmm. So what's that mm -hmm. all about? And how is it, you mm -hmm. know, how do we access that for ourselves? And a lot of it comes yeah. through understanding. You know, it's, it's not mm -hmm. what you have, it's how you understand and value what you have. And I think that, uh, you know, we all understand, I mean, all of us who've been practicing for a while understand that your happiness depends not so much on what you have or what you do, but it's how you relate to it. And that's the, yes. that's the work of the mind. And a lot, of a lot of the work of the mind is coming to understand the nature of the mind, how the mind is, how the mm -hmm. mind works. Nicely said. That, that, that's, a, that's fantastic, and I think that's a really nice place um, to, to leave with those remarks because I think that's very helpful for uh, so, so many people that these practices can be used to develop these positive psychological qualities. So, um, and maybe that's the, that's the next step for the mindfulness movement, which would be a fantastic um, place for everyone to go. So yeah. thank you so much for coming on the Wisdom podcast. Um, been an honor to have you on and an honor to publish this book thank you so much thank you for the invitation and for publishing the book look forward to seeing it all so i hope you enjoyed the episode with Stephen. Uh, next week we have shyla catherine joining us shyla has been practicing meditation since 1980 and has more than eight years of accumulated silent retreat experience so in the next episode, we talk about different meditation techniques, the role of jhanas in practice, and much, much more. So please join us. 
for a conversation with Shyla Catherine. I used um, the breath as the primary object. Yeah. And then after doing the jhana practice with the four, what are called material jhanas, so using the breath as the basis, um, then I went on to um, establish and explore the what are called the immaterial yeah. or, or arupa yeah. states, the immaterial states, which are based, uh, they're deep absorption states based upon perceptions of infinite space, infinite consciousness, yeah. nothingness, or a state that's called neither perception nor non-perception. <laughs> So I might, we maybe start there. If you could explain that to us, that would be great. <laughs>